Um, and uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about just uh, education plan because I talked, I connected with VFDA uh, and I want to just go over sort of what they have for proposal because it's not exactly what the board was looking for, but um, I want to just make sure that that works for the board. Um, and then um, we need to just talk again a little bit more about the the um, letter to the to the voters in the in the um, town reports. And then Lane's going to give us an update in terms of where things are at with the budget. Um, so that's kind of the focus of the meeting. We do have an executive session um, for this meeting as well um, uh, regarding the, the committee with the bus drivers, um, some personnel issues, and the real estate. Um, so. Uh, we need to have a meeting evaluator. So, and usually Linda brings the I couldn't the find the evaluation book. form. You <laughs> couldn't find for the book. form. So, um, but somebody could just evaluate just using their own judgments, and I think that would be fine. Um, we don't necessarily need that formal. Uh, check off. So, do I have a volunteer? And I'm happy to do it. Just, okay. I'll do it. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and then just don't let me, the last time I forgot to ask the person <laughs> that was evaluating to actually share. So, um, let's make sure we do that at the end of the meeting. Uh, so, uh, public comments. This time around, I didn't have any email comments from any folks, um, and it doesn't appear to be that we have anybody from the public. So I think we'll move forward on that. Um, so uh, next up is um, just what I found out from the VSBA. I sent um, just late this early evening uh, the contract that um, VSBA writes everything up as a contract. So I met with uh, Sue Olson, I believe is her last name. Uh, she's the gal who's in charge of uh, providing education and support to boards. Um, and she connected me with um, Jackie, and I'm going to forget her name, her, her last name, uh, Jackie, I pulled it up here so I would remember, Jacqueline, ah, now of course it's not coming up, but anyway, uh, Jackie is the policy governance uh, trainer that the VSBA has engaged. Um, and so I had a conversation with her, just letting her know what, um, what we were looking for. And what she proposed to do is um, basically to um, meet with us uh, over, we're going to have five hours of training with her. Um, the first um, training would just would be a time for her to just review in general what policy governance is and what it isn't. Um, and she wants to have us just to do kind of a self-assessment as a board in terms of what's working and what isn't working um, so that so that we can um, understand kind of uh, where we are with things and then from there kind of make a training plan and then use the remaining time with her to kind of work on things that we feel we want to work on to improve our, our process and to improve our policies. So they don't do a strict um, walk through policies, which is what had happened before with the with the required um, state and federal policies they don't they don't do that so 
Um, she will help us work with our policies, but we will be doing the changes if we want to make changes. So that's in a nutshell. Um, it's very inexpensive. Uh, they're charging us $120 per hour of training, so the whole training would be $600 for the board. Um, and we could always, if, if we felt like we needed more, we could. Um, Jackie was a superintendent. She used policy governance in her district. Um, so she has practice sort of implementing policy governance uh, processes. So um, she said that is her strength going into it. She said, not necessarily a policy governance expert, but I've used the system and has experience from that standpoint. So we as a board need to decide, is this, I mean, it's not exactly what you all wanted um, me to have, but, but what we were looking for is not offered through the USBA, just sort of having somebody kind of rewrite our policies for us or help us rewrite our policies. She will, she will, she can help in that process, but um, she said, you guys are going to have to do the rewriting. But is this in response to our question about what is this in response to? So remember, one of the things that we've been trying to do is just relook at our policies, and each time we do a monitoring of a policy, we're looking at do we want to make any changes to any of the policies. Yeah. Um, and so she will kind of help us understand that process and how you can do that. Um, but she won't. She won't look through them and say you should change this. That's there isn't somebody that will do that. Will she use our policies as, like is she gonna take us through one, what the, what the process would be, or is it all? We can, that can be part of what we ask her to help us do. Um, she wants to first get an overall assessment of kind of where we're at and what, we're, what, what our challenges are and what our strengths are in terms of how we're using our policies currently. And then we're going to need to sort of guide her in terms of what what we want to work on. Um, when Katja and I met for the agenda meeting, um, Jackie was willing to come and use sort of the education section of our meetings to do the training. And Katja and I sort of talked about it and felt that that might be, um, that might not work for everyone, that people might want to just focus on the training part in a separate meeting. So, um, so we have, um, and, and Jackie's willing to um, do that. She is doing jury duty. So um, she gave me a, several dates in January that she would be available. Um, but she would need a start time of 6.30 or 7. Uh, well, I think that was also something we wanted to bring to the, to the group to see whether right. or not. I mean, because it was originally um, going to be an hour, yeah. correct? So the thought process, the thought was, do we want to add an hour of just this focused training on top of our meeting, knowing that we would still then have like our typical hour and a half meeting? Or is right. that just too much for us all to deal with that and then try to have our board meeting at the same time. Right. So it's, it's open, obviously it's, it's not a done deal, but it has to be done that way, but that was just a thought process that we had. So would love to hear from you guys as far as if so you is would it rather just do one it. meeting? No, no, it so five it, hours. It was five <laughs> hours, yes. So it would be one hour, a one hour session, five, five times. times. Yeah, yeah. Up, up to, right? Right, up to five. Up, and ending before Feb 1. So this would be, right? Uh, 2022. Oh, so that's just the year. Nope, no, 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 that's, that's the next 2022 is coming. Yeah. <laughs> so that's two to three in 
December and January, whichever we decide where the two or oh, three are. Oh, okay. I was misreading that. I was like, that's weird. Um, because I thought it went. I was thinking February of twenty, the next 23. year. Twenty-three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. That's what she'd want to get it done probably Boy. once a week or something, and that's way more than I'm willing to commit to personally. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you guys were paying attention to the date. <laughs> Time is not necessarily so. Do we want to propose a different? Well, I mean, I think the, like, the first is, is this something that seems valuable to the group as far as a what we're looking to get out of things? Um, so would this be a value to us? And then, so that's the first question. And the second question is, if it's a value to us, do we want to break it into a separate training session, or do we want to include it in our regular board meeting, knowing that it would be one hour of our board meeting? And that would be one hour in January. So that's because that's all. That's because this meeting is right now, and then it would have to be before February first. Yeah. Right. So we could also change. I think we could change that because when I talked with Jackie, I mentioned uh, January to June, and she was like, "Yep, yep, that's it." And so that's why when I saw the. Thing. I was thinking, boy, the VSBA gave us until February. <laughs> but I uh, apologize, I didn't pay attention to that 2022 date. Um, so let, I think, I think it would be a little bit hard to move that quickly. Yeah, I don't think we could move that quickly. No, yeah. I don't think we could either. Yeah. Um, well, I guess from what Anne has um, explained of what she offers. Does anyone feel, what are people's feelings on whether or not it would be valuable for what we're looking to achieve with our policy review? It sounds like it could be valuable. It could be, it could be a total bust, but we wouldn't know unless we mm -hmm. try it. Um, wouldn't the value come in just looking at the specific policies that are sort of relative to our exact, it's like more like our personal, I want to say personal, but it's not personal, but it's like specific to our school and board and. Right. And that's what we'd be doing with her. Looking at And we would be looking and assessing how the, system, the governance system overall is working for us and what we might want to change or where we're feeling like, you know, I don't understand, you know, when you know, the process of what we should be doing or if we're going to review, how do we review? How do we know, like from the last meeting, people were sort of like, I don't know what might need to be changed or if it needs to be changed. So maybe diving in a little bit deeper into our policies, understanding them, understanding the monitoring so that we feel comfortable that our policies are saying what they need to say and that we understand how to use them to, to deal with any concerns that we might have in terms of our ability to govern the district. I mean, I guess it sounds like a fine training. I would not want to do it during the meeting. I would want to do it separately. And I think that if we can do it between now and June, or now and next February, then that's great. But between now and this February, and this February not a great is idea. Little. No, yeah. and I think it would be a value too if we had a training that started now and then continued as new board members come on, yes. if new board members come on to help them okay. understand the whole policy governance as well. So, right, right. Mm -hmm. What sounds the most valuable to me is just it feels like our biggest stumbling block right now is where do we start. Mm -hmm. How do we begin to review? So that piece holds value for me. Yeah, you have uh, your so the policy governance piece that you you have is actually having been through it three four times now is fairly robust. I haven't seen anything missing that I would say, hey, you should have this as well. Um, I think a lot of it and what you have seems like it was is was pretty well covers everything that should be covered. A lot of it, I think, comes down to your own kind of, as a board and as a kind of a collective group, what your personal flair is and feelings are, or if there are things that have changed in the world that would require some changes to them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but. 
Were the policies created when the merger between the three schools? 2016, happened? I think. No, that it. We were doing policy governance before the merger. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we were doing it for quite a while beforehand. Then you you guys merged before Act 46, so a year or so before. Yeah, I can't remember the date of the actual merger. Um, yeah, and, and we were one of the first districts to go with policy governance. So that's where when I had the conversation with Jackie, she was, she was like, you're, you know, a lot of the districts that then followed to, to create a policy governance, governing structure, looked at our policies and, and modeled their own after ours. So what other kinds of governance are there? Well, everything in the VSBA is policy governance. It's just that policy governance, the trademark policy governance, is a certain way of doing it. And Jackie um, would probably be able to help us look at, if you decided to go away from the trademark policy governance to just straight, you know, creating your own sort of policy governance, because in general, the, the VSBA is wanting every district to run from a, a policy-driven focus versus getting into um, the details. The details. The weeds. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so I guess I think we should do it if we can spread it out over the course of the next year. Okay. So, and that would be our only training for this next year? Uh, unless, as we meet with her, we, we decide. So we have a training budget. We have a budget of, well, this past decide year that. was 10,000. Yeah, right? my, my recommendation is 15 based upon what you did last year. Because you, you added in um, the strategic planning uh, mm -hmm. piece that added a little more. So I think it came out to probably spend it about 12 in total, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Um, so if you, if you put, in, put away for 15 today, um, I think that'll cover you for everything that you need and more. And our current budget, though, is about, is. 10,000, yep. right. And, and we, we required a certain amount, right, to do a certain amount within fiscal years. Correct. Uh, so, you're, you're required to do so many hours of training. Yeah. 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 So, but to, to go along with Chelsea's question, if we do this in this fiscal year, it wouldn't apply to hours for the following year, so it wouldn't necessarily be the only training. And as we consult with Jackie, we may find that, you know, her expertise, again, she was like, don't let them think that I am like the expert in policy governance. She's a practitioner. She kn she's used the system. She's fairly familiar with it. Um, but she kept saying, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in, the, in the sort of the theory behind the, the system so um, but she's had practical experience using it and you know if she felt like you know she she might recommend you know maybe we pull someone in to just you know that maybe is more expert on monitoring or whatever but um, we have to kind of assess sort of where we're at and that's part of what she will help us with in this process But I apologize because I thought we had longer. I didn't realize um, that that it was February, the 2022, that we would have to have it all done because that seems a little bit um, too quick. And even if we were to add it in for our meetings, if we're doing five sessions, that would bring us to June anyway, or close to it. So, um, so do you want me to go back to Carrie Lamb, who put together the contract, and say, hold on? 
and I'll double and I can double check with Jackie and just say we're we're not we don't have the, the bandwidth to do it all you know super quickly. Um, and we can also play it by ear. You know, she might say, you know, if we did two hours, we could do two hours in this area. You know, once she sort of assesses where we're at and and where we want to go. Um, yeah, I think we need it'll to give us a more of a an idea of kind of where what our needs are and the and the assistance that we need from her. If we can extend it, I think that's the first question because if they say no, then we're not going right. to do it back to the right. Okay. All right, so I need to find out then. Uh, and it could have just been, because uh, uh, Carrie wasn't the one, it was Sue who was there. And Sue is actually getting ready to retire. So she just, she wanted to sort of get the contract up and, and rolling, because then she's going to retire. Um, so let me just find out if we can extend to is June sufficient, or do we want to say extend to July? You could use it for your strategic planning in the summer, too. Mm -hmm. Session. Um, so what do we want? June, July? I mean, I would go out as far as we could, because okay. that way it gives us a buffer in case one month something doesn't work out. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, so, okay. August. That will get us all the way through the summer. Um, and kind of prepare. And then, uh, do you want me to just ask too if she's willing to add in more sessions? If we need, I mean, they would just need to write up another contract if we wanted more, more sessions. It didn't sound like have these and then no others. It was just let's start with five and just kind of see where. Where the board is at at that point. I don't think you need to ask about okay. extending it. But. They probably it's probably not a big deal in any way. So if right. we get through our five hours and we think we want more, I'm sure it's they will have no problem yeah. giving you a okay. new contract. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll check in on that and then um, dates for the first session. I think we need to know first, because if they say that we okay. they can only do it through February, then there's no point. Then there's no point. Right now. Okay. Okay. All right. So then that means we don't really get started then until February anyway. Because that's going to... Well, once we hear, we can send an email around. That's appropriate. Okay. okay. So we'll try. Okay. So we'll do that via email, setting up the first the first um so are we a go then if we can extend to august or so yes yeah okay so then i'll go ahead and sign off and then um and then we'll just figure out the date okay. via via email for Sounds january good. okay that sound all right mm -hmm. I wonder if we should make a motion. <laughs> yeah, Let's have a do. motion for that, please. I'll make a motion. We have Ann contact the uh, VSB to see if we can extend um, the training until August. And if it they can, to sign up and then schedule afterwards. A second. A second. A second from Megan. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. All right. So then, uh, annual conference. Um, I have a, I, I attended, um, I didn't get to see the waiting, or I saw part of the waiting study, which is really interesting and would benefit our district fair amount if, if it goes through, but I don't know exactly what's going to be happening. That's where they're looking at education funding and trying to make it more equitable. And in the process, they're um, sort of re-weighting schools where you have a higher special education, number of kids in special education, uh, ESL students and students in 
poverty. Um, so um, with our district and the, sh uh, and the numbers in our district, um, that it could really um, actually be a, a benefit to us, but there's, there's some politics in terms of uh, when they would do that and given sort of the situation um, with COVID and everything else, they're not wanting to move too quickly in, in implementing things. Yeah. Um, was the I got. yeah, they're in a weird position. Um, they did send out uh, a formula that we used when they did the budget presentation last month, and also when we talk about the budget a little bit today, um, to try to estimate, you know, what what we would be receiving because it's supposed to go into effect um, under the law next year. So it affects our budget year next year. Um, the problem is, is that there were a lot of provisions that were supposed to be followed through on that weren't probably because of COVID. And so then the question is, um, they've got a, a group out there that's kind of reevaluating the weights that's supposed to be doing a report by like December 15th. Um, and then the question is, is the legislature, when it gets back in session, going to extend things? Is it going to keep it you know, running for next year? We just don't know. Um, but it would take a le legislative act at this point in time to, to stop that block grant um, you know, change from happening. Um, I think most of the superintendents I've spoken to are all for it. Um, I think it's going to benefit our district um, in the end. Right now with the formula that they gave to us, it, it keeps us about equal um, to what we've always um, had to spend uh, for special education services. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest thing that the superintendents are worried about is just hold, making sure that all districts are held harmless. In other words, you know, nobody wants to wake up you know, t two months after you've done your votes for the community and find out that the legislation has changed it and now, you know, you're getting 400,000 less than you thought you were. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the concern right now. Uh, but, yeah. There was also a really great speaker on just conflict and dealing with conflict. Um, they recorded everything, so I, I have an email out to Carrie. She hasn't gotten back to me, but... Um, if it is recorded, I'm hoping that they're going to make it available to board members. But just in terms of you know thinking about um, community members and just the amount of stress and tension between teachers and community members and and just the heightened uh, stress level and and conflict and polarization in you know in our community and in the state and in the nation. It might be worthwhile. It's about an hour or so. Um, the the presentation I thought was really uh, helpful in terms of thinking about how to deal with um, differing views and conflict. So um, she she does a uh, she did a, she had a great presentation. Um, so once that comes through, or once I hear back from Carrie, I may just send it out to you all, and um, you can listen when it's convenient for you. Um, so that's the, v the VSBA conference. Um, next up is the, the report to the voters. And last time we sort of talked a little bit about um, what we wanted in the, in the annual report. So we talked about including some information about ends um, and acknowledgement uh, for the staff for their continued um, their continued work during this uh, what we thought was maybe going to be the end of COVID and now it's just seeming to be the never ending COVID story. Um, so just acknowledging that, um, maybe talking about. Um, our success in the union negotiations because we've been we spent a fair amount of time uh, doing those um, and then talking a little bit about the strategic planning process and where we're going with that so what I was hoping is that maybe a couple of people wanted to take on a section of the report and maybe um, Put something together, and then, and then we can kind of work from there. 
uh, one of the things that might be helpful, I don't remember if I mentioned this, um, Ben Merrill, who manages our website, is also a PR um, person. Mm -hmm. And so in previous years, um, a lot of times what we'll do is um, folks will sit down with Ben and say, hey, this is what we're looking at uh, for the annual report. Um, this is what we'd like you to include, and he has all the information because um, everything that I send uh, and everybody in the district sends, uh, he puts up on the website, and he usually can pull something together in a draft form um, and um, can kind of get it up to kind of a semi-draft form, and at that, that point in time, then whoever is, is kind of finalizing it can finalize it and then bring it before the board. But that's, that's been the typical process, and he's really good at it, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That sounds great. So, but if you have folks that are willing to yeah, yeah, tell them what you want, no. Is this typically signed by like the whole board, or is it from the board, from the chair? I feel like in the past years, I feel like I just saw Laura's name. Like last um, it's typically the chair is the the has been the writer. Um, that's not typically how how it's done because as a group you, sh you should be speaking with one voice. It should be everybody. Um, but um, again, every board does it a little bit differently, um, and so I think it, it was it'd probably be good if it was from from everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I do an annual um, report as well um, for the annual meeting. Mine's typically a little bit different. I typically take a look at you know where what we accomplished last year and where, where we're headed um, because a lot of it's about trying to sell the budget um, to folks mm -hmm. and so that they know exactly you know why we're asking for what we're asking for and what we what we did and what we asked for in the previous year mm -hmm. so. so does that mean you're going to focus on the ends report will you oh a, a, a little bit um, a lot of it I'm not sure how well that interprets over easily to the community who's reading it but a lot of it is, hey, this is the money that we had, this is the purpose we put it to, to, and it should result or it has resulted in this benefit. And so kind of, kind of yes, kind of no. Um, that, that, the ENDS report that I, I put together with what we had, we, unless somebody wants to really sit down and go through fine detail, but I think it might be a bit confusing. Um, but they, you know, they are parallel. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not, not going to use quite the same language typically, just because right. of the audience. Right. right. So I was hoping that we could get a few people to kind of get together. I mean, maybe we just create a subcommittee that, or or if people have, um, you know, certain things they want to they want to focus on. So like, if you're like, I really want to make sure we mention this or that in regard to the ends. Um, you know, maybe somebody wants to head up that sort of section of it and. And then um, Ashley had mentioned acknowledgement of the staff, and um, I don't know if someone wants to sort of take on the negotiations as a something to just report out that you know, we, or if you think that's worth reporting out to the voters. And then the strategic plan, I can talk about that because I was involved in that. Um, and then, and then uh, we could also just talk about too that, you know, we're, we're getting ourselves trained, we're working on figuring, you know, learning about how to operate as a board. So do you have any people with dying to get involved in sort of putting at, at least together an outline of what we want to share with the community. So would this be a place where we would share with the community that the ends aren't necessarily where we want them to be and it's because we are not functioning at a capacity in terms of employing the people to put the put the programs in front of the students so that they are competent in at least English, math, and science, so then we can move on to things like arts and, I mean, isn't that something that the voters should know about? Yeah, I mean, it's a perfect thing to communicate. It seems mm -hmm. like this would be the time to portray that so that when the budget goes up, they're like, oh, okay, this, this is, is why. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's good to keep them them posted on. Again, it's it's what we're using the money for. I mean, we're asking for twenty one million. It's uh, 
that's a big chunk of change. Um, and so they should 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 know exactly what we're working on. Um, and uh, you know, it also relates to them that there is a bigger plan, right? There's we've got the three pieces that three four pieces that we're working on very closely with right now. And as soon as those hits a certain threshold, we'll be taking that money and, and moving it over. Unless folks decide that they really want to pony up and try to do it all at once. Um, so yeah, no, I think it's a really good thing. And Ben, Ben is a perfect person. Again, if you, a lot of it, if you just have the conversation with him um, and, and talk about it, and, and you know, can point him towards source documents, he'll, like I said, he'll, he'll produce a pretty good first draft for you mm -hmm. um, right off the bat. Yep. So it sounds like we just need somebody to kind of chat with Ben. Yeah, or, or a couple people with different ideas, and um, you know, work with them to kind of collaborate to see what's the best way to put it all together. <clears throat> so, do we have a few people who want to be involved in that? You sure, seem, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be involved in it. When, when, like, when <laughs> does it have to be done by? Uh, typically, should draft time. You know, early January. Right. Because again, the the goal is to have it out in the um, as as a part of after you do your vote on in early January on the budget. That that's part of the materials that kind of back up that that vote that you made. It goes so into the town goes town, report, the town reports, reports and, and they usually have a deadline for when. They yeah. Do. So it's in our it's in the in the annual agenda for January. So yeah. we've I think got it has to be, yeah, submitted. I think to the town's right. usually by mid to end of January. Yeah. yeah. So we need so we have basically a month. Okay, who is Ben? Ben, who? Ben Merrill. Merrill, M-E-R-R-I-L. If um, you go into your Orange Southwest, um, he's there. Just type, start typing Ben, his name will come right up. Okay. So, and so do you I... want to work with, I mean, someone else, yeah? Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I would be interested. Um, any, anyone else? All right, we ready to take this on? Yeah, sure. Okay, so, um, and if you want, we can just talk on the side to, to maybe just do some things via email or we can even do I know, can people. we communicate? Do we need to sub privately? You're not, you're not a quorum. We're not a quorum. So we can. But you should probably should vote to authorize them to do the work that will be presented to and voted on the board by the board in January. All right. If that makes sense. So we'll create a subcommittee of two, or or can we just say we're that Chelsea and I are going to work together to create a draft of the. I move to have Anne and Chelsea work with Ben Merrill to create a draft for the um, report to voters. I'll second. Mm -hmm. okay. Any discussion? All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So that's decided. Um, okay. So next up, we have um, just the review. So this is the first review of the EL. 2.4, the planning and budgeting, um, monitoring report, and the emergency superintendent succession. Um, Lynn, yeah. want to just tell us? Yeah, uh, 2.4 is actually kind of apropos, because uh, we're right in the middle of a budgeting season. Mm -hmm. But really, um, in general, it's looking to, to ensure that you know the budget's aligning um, with the ends, uh, the way that the board would like. Um, that our practices uh, ensure that we're always in the black at the end of the budget year, um, and that our financial predictions that we're using, like we were just talking about the um, the Act 76, um, the, the block grant money that's coming in from SPED, that they're based on reasonable data and reasonable research. And so that's what that one's about. 
Um, 2.5 um, has to do with uh, having things set up so that somebody can step in on a, on a temporary basis should the superintendent be incapacitated. Um, and that's a, a fairly simple one, and it's actually one that we're trying to enhance a little bit um, with this year's budget. Um, typically what I've done in the past is there's always two people in the district that I've signed a letter of authority over to that in my incapacitation they have um, signing rights and, and have the full authority that, that I do. Um, the cabinet is also kept in pretty good contact with most of the things that are happening in the district. We meet at least every other week. Um, we discuss most things, um, which keeps them in the loop so they would be able to keep things going for a little while if they needed to. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we talked um, about this budget, about needing additional staff at the central office and kind of going back and forth between the human resources and the assistant superintendent um, piece. One of the reasons that I, I kind of switched over a little bit to the assistant superintendent um, piece was to support this um, and the civic executive limitation a little bit. Um, to make sure that you've got a single individual. It would be tough if, uh, you know, if you were out without a superintendent for a month or two, it would be tough for any individual to be able to maintain their own work and try to do this on top of it, you know, piecemeal, so. Yeah. And I do report compliance on both. <clears throat> Um, next up, you were going to share with us how you're doing with yeah. the Yeah. Yep. Um, this is just a couple of slides. So I, give me a second to see if I can pull this up. Yeah, we did the full um, presentation at the last meeting, but there's been some changes. Um, and a couple of things to, to remind folks of, especially if, if um, new to the board, is that in January, you'll actually be voting on three separate budgets. Um, so the one that we talked about, the big one, is the OSSD. That's the one um, of the money that flows into the elementary schools uh, and the high school. Um, there's also the technical center budget, um, which is a separate vote. And then there is the Raven program. Um, we have a program um, for students, um, primarily on, on IEPs um, with, with different disabilities um, that we run in-house um, and uh, serves a lot of our students, but also serves a lot of other students um, from the surrounding districts as well. And so we'll talk about all three of those today. Um, right now, um, we actually, did get some data finally we talked uh last time sorry about that i hate it when it does that um we talked last time about um you know it's usually december 15th or later before we get the final formulas from the state but they were put stuff out like early this morning um, so we had some data um, that we can share there's actually a lot of really good news um, out there which I'll, I'll show you um, when we get to the next slide here but there are also some concerns um, they have a lot more flow into the education fund than they expected like significantly more um, so that should be a help um, to taxpayers and especially some of the things that we're asking for this year but one of the biggest problems, and this one we can't evaluate yet, we won't get this information until uh, closer to the end of December, is uh, tax rates for, for folks, um, usually the biggest thing that they're determined by is what they call the common level of appraisal, right? So right now in this pandemic, what's happened is there were a lot of people trying to move um, into Vermont out of the big cities. Um, housing prices have gone up, and so what that means is that tax rates are probably going to go up as well because and again not in our control has nothing to do with the schools but if people's houses are worth more um, then the state is going to expect to be able to to charge more uh, in kind of the, the most basic of senses uh, but, but they've gone up quite a bit um, so most towns can expect a higher tax rate um, again has nothing to do with the schools and the other concern that people should just be aware of is right inflation right now is up, up around six percent um, doesn't look like it's going to be breaking anytime soon. Historically, for New England, it's been about 1.6% for like the last decade. Um, it's been, been pretty stable. All right. So we talked last, uh, last month um, about the fact that, you know, we're talking about expenses. We don't know too much about revenue. 
um, because we got to wait until the formulas come in. So you know, we, we added a lot to the expense size, a lot of things that we're looking looking for um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I said that you know the revenue picture actually looked pretty pretty rosy, um, and it, and it does. There should actually be a large increase to our revenue. Um, they gave out the yield um, prediction, the numbers that we should be using to, to calculate the yields. Probably the most basic way to explain that to, to folks, even though it's not quite accurate, is it's how much we get per student from the education fund. Based upon what they're saying right now, um, at a minimum, that yield is going to give us about 1600 extra dollars per student. So we're talking somewhere between 800000 and $1.28 million of new money just because of that yield change that's coming in from re revenue from the Ed Fund. Um, we also, if you remember, I set aside a significant amount um, in an operational reserve fund, figuring that it was going to take us three years to recover from COVID. Well, the second payment of that is due to help offset the taxpayers next year, so there will be 412000 from that operational reserve fund. Um, to go in to kind of balance out our expenses. And then the other thing that we've got going on, which we have no idea what the impact is yet, they, they don't have the numbers yet, is what they call the average daily membership. So in other words, um, the number of students that we have on a two-year average um, determines how much we get, uh, and we had a huge increase this year. So we'll see 50% of the benefit of that, uh, those increased enrollments this year, and the, and the remainder of the, the benefit of that next year. And that goes on into perpetuity as long as, as we continue to, to have students, um, that number of students. So minimally, we're looking at a $1.2 million uh, increase in terms of revenues next year. Um, and that's minimal. That's about as conservative as, as, as I can make it. It's probably, if, if everything they're saying is true, it's probably going to be significantly more than that. Um, since the last time we spoke, um, we added a few more things um, to the budget um, that, that came up. Um, the tech department, again, they are doing a one, what's called a one-to-one -one program with computers. Every kid in the district right down through preschool has a computer or an iPad um, that they do the majority of their, their work and their communication with their teachers through. Um, we've only had three folks in the tech department for time out of mind, um, and they are strapped. They not only manage all that, they manage all the software um, for the district at all levels at all schools, and so it's, it's time to get them some extra help. So we had put in for an extra body. That was done last time. In addition to it, in the past, they used to have um, students come in over the summertime um, to provide extra help for the, the more basic work. You know, just, just swapping the computers out, basic updates, things like that, that uh, are, are a low level that uh, the techs can take off their plates so they can work on the higher level things. And hopefully focus a little bit more on, on, on the educational aspect of things as well. Um, because, uh, you know, one of them is, is a specialist in using technology to, to, to help educate children. Um, so they're looking for $4,000 for summer tech help. Based upon the final discussion that the... Uh, subcommittee head with the the bus drivers, which hasn't been finalized, but where you are at, we added in what the potential cost change would be. Um, we had already added in an anticipated cost in the last budget. Based upon your discussions, it would be an additional 19000 to that. Um, we also had a sabbatical request that the board will be reviewing in January. Um, that's where a teacher takes um, half a year or uh, a year off under the CBA. Um, if the board approves it, they're allowed to do that. Um, and while they're out, we have to get a replacement teacher for them. Um, and so that's what that money is for. And then um, kind of expanding the role of our preschool coordinator, that's Pat Miller. Um, we had put some money in there for her to, to keep that going. But we're really having some deep discussions about... Um, close to full day for, for three-year-olds. You know, we were hesitant against doing that um, early on because, you know, you can't keep three-year-olds, you know, in an educational program that long, but it doesn't need to be. We can do the 10 hours of education and then just provide the services to the parents that need it. Um, plus the fact that you're probably going to get a lot better um, from us than, than they would in, in, in most locales that are out there. Um, it's also in anticipation of... Um, the federal work that's been happening. One of the pieces they've been focused on is trying to provide additional funding um, 
for expanding preschool. And so it's, it's trying to get things set up. Um, this also goes, that goes towards the ends. Um, it's literally, it's a whole extra year of education we've got right now for the students, right, our four-year-olds. We have full free, um, full day free preschool for four-year-olds and it's expanding that down into the third grade. And these are the kids that, that need the work the most um, because a lot of them, what we're recognizing is they are not coming in with the, the skills um, from the families, you know, basic things like being able to count from one to 20, um, say the alphabet, um, which I think that the, the, the three-year-old preschool will be able to help. Can I ask a quick question sure. about the sabbatical? What is the agreement, the, the, what does the teacher have to fulfill during a sabbatical? That's one of the, I'm going to argue that that's potentially one of the weaknesses of, of your CBA. Okay. Uh, most districts don't do this anymore, um, but typically what a sabbatical is for is for uh, folks to go out and gain additional knowledge or education that they're going to be able to bring back and it's going to trickle down to the kids. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the good questions usually when I talk with the teachers is, hey, you know, if when you're putting in this request, it might, might be helpful if... You know, you say, say what you're doing, um, but technically, I, I'll have to go back. I haven't reviewed that section in a little while. I think, you know, we, we have to take the first one that applies each year, um, the way that things are written in the CBA. Okay. Yeah. Good to, okay. Yeah. But, yeah, no, a lot of times it was um, universities started it, especially when they had their professors doing research. Right, or they had to break. A they, yeah, they or, needed to yeah. take a break from their, um, their teaching duties to, to wrap up, you know, the yeah. final year of their research. Um, so what we're looking at um, potentially is right a, a 1.2 million or greater, probably greater, increase in revenue and a 1.1 million dollar increase in uh, expenses. So we're actually well in the black. Um, actually, be saving folks a little bit of money. Um, I am prepared to cut if we need to. Um, again, we've got the preliminary numbers from the state. Um, anywhere from 274,000 to 415,000 um, out of the request. And I'll do a pie chart for you um, in the final presentation when everything is kind of getting close to finalized once we've got all the final numbers from the state. Um, I'll put together a, a budget that I am sure is going to pass but is going to get us most of what we want. Uh, that's kind of kind of my job. But the pie chart, one of the things that it'll show is okay, this is what we're asking for. This part of it is, is mandatory. We don't have a choice. And then there's what we call discretionary. And you'll see that the mandatory will probably be 75% of, uh, of everything. So we'll talk a little bit about it. So any questions on the OSSD part? Yeah, I'm expecting, um, go back to this a little bit. Um, I'm expecting there are going to be some huge increases um, just in cost, staffing. You know, I, I, I kind of put that in the superintendent's report. We're not going to see turnover this year. And, and when I say we, I mean education collectively across the country. We're going to see an exodus. Um, the, the last couple of years under COVID um, have taken a toll. Um, we had administrators leaving in districts today. Um, I was hearing the superintendent shooting emails back and forth um, and teachers as well. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that come February, you know, we turn a corner, uh, get enough of the little guys um, vaccinated so that we don't have to, people aren't as stressed, and um, hopefully the Omicron is, is what most viruses do. You know, it's more, more contagious but less dangerous. That, that's usually what happens to them over time. Um, RTCC is a little bit more problematic, um, and one of the things that makes their life difficult um, is that they had a pretty good increase in enrollment um, this year, which is going to continue into next year, but it takes three years um, for them to get additional benefits, additional money from the state for that increased enrollment. And so you get stuck into this horrible position where we've got all these kids, we're not getting any more money, um, and so for three years, but we still have to have the staff to, to work with them. And so that's kind of where they're at. So what Felicia was asking for, which is, is, is well-deserved, and we'll talk about this a little bit, is she was looking to get a, an assistant director, a .5 assistant director, and a .5 um, FTE science instructor, hopefully in the same person. Um, one of the reasons for the science is that's directly related to the ENDS, um, right? You know, the science SBAC is one of the things that I chose uh, for the ENDS. 
And what ends up happening is, you know, 50% of our classes typically go over to the, the, the technical center and um, they don't get science that year. And 11th grade is the year that they take the, the uh, science S back. And so the hope is, is that, you know, providing this service um, for those students is going to make sure that, you know, they're getting the science they need to perform well on that, that, that assessment. On the SAT or the SBAC? So the science, the science, the, the SBAC, that's, yeah. So that's the state, used to be, what was it, NECAP that you NECAP, guys had? Yeah. It was always NCAS in Massachusetts. Every state kind of did their own thing. Uh, but they, they, oh, sorry about that, Vermont Science Assessment. But if kids aren't having the science that they need in their junior year, then they're probably not going to score well on their SAT either. Uh, potentially, you are, you are correct, because they have changed it over to being the subject test. Yep. Uh, that goes up, I believe, through biology, unless they've changed it. I haven't done like a principal's report in a long time, so I'm not as um, involved with the SAT piece. But it used to go up at least through biology. Um, so it may or may not impact them, uh, usually that, that third year's chemistry. So that it's a very very good point. Um, they have a math teacher there um, that's helping provide math instruction um, for students to make sure that they can still meet their graduation requirements from their sending schools, um, so that they can still graduate. Um, the point three of it has been in, paid for under the Perkins grant. Uh, the other .7 is uh, out of the regular budget. Um, you can only carry things for so many years under the Perkins grant before they expect you to take it out. And so um, Felicia is, is wisely trying to get this moved out into the regular budget. Uh, they have a single parent professional there um, who works, works with the students. Um, half of it was being paid for in Perkins. Um, the other half uh, was in the regular budget. They want to get the other .5 moved in. Um, she was looking for additional supplies, and I'll tell you why these are in red in just a minute, of about $50,000 for furniture replacement, um, kind of a one-time cost. Um, and then in the blue, um, I've kind of broken a couple of things down. Um, there is the CBA-mandated salary, kind of what we were talking about with the, the, the pie chart. That's the increase that they're looking at just because of everybody's moving up a step on the pay scale because of the um, additional cost of benefits for your, for the teachers um, and, and because of the, the contracted increases uh, that we've given through negotiations. The discretionary is everything else, the things that we're talking about. Um, what is likely going to happen um, is there is no way that we can, you know, increase a, a $3 million budget by almost half a million dollars, 429000 um, because it would be catastrophic to the tuition, um, right? Because it's all tuition based. A lot of it, you know, we get reimbursement from the state, but a lot of it's the tuition the schools pay. Um, it would probably cause a three or three thousand dollar increase in tuition if we did this all at once. So the two things in red I am going to recommend we take off <clears throat> the fifty thousand. Um, I'm going to recommend to Felicia that we put in a request to the board to take that money from the reserve funds. Um, so that it doesn't have to you know, hit the, the tuition line since it's kind of one-time stuff anyway. Um, and then the director, this one's a little bit more problematic. Um, the director of the science instructor um, piece we need to talk about. Um, one of the problems with uh, having an, a, a director, an assistant director at the, a tech center is the fact that the state typically reimburses about 30% for any employees at the tech center. But the, um, uh, an assistant director, they won't do that until you've had uh, 150 kids on a three-year average, which we don't have. So we won't get that reimbursement. So her numbers are up there to get there now. Uh, they're between 150 and 160, um, but we have to keep, keep them up there for, for three years, which is likely. Um, but uh, at this point, I think it's just going to going to be too expensive. Um, I may talk with her a little bit. Um, I'm going to meet with her next week uh, about providing instruction and the best way to do it. Um, what a lot of schools have done, um, as I was going up through the ranks, is uh, in situations like this, is they'll create an online academy. Um, they'll have one instructor that works with the kids on their online courses, keeps them up to date, keeps them on track, provides tutoring if they need it, as opposed to having three separate teachers. So with the online academy, they can take any course they want and any subject they want. 
um, and then have a, a single person that works with the students that are in that online program. And so instead of having three separate, you know, uh, inst instructional teachers there, you know, we would only need one. But that's a that's a discussion, and, and she she would have to be on board with that. So there's going to be some adjustments to this before next time, and I'll also we should have enough information from the state um, to be able to say what the impact on tuition is going to be. So questions on that? A lot easier when I'm standing if I'm doing a presentation. It's tough. If I'm <clears throat> Uh, the Raven program, that's our, 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 our program um, for IEP students with, with certain special needs. Um, and this is going to go down next year. Um, they're about a quarter million dollar program. Um, the total expenses are going to go down by a little over $14,000. Their tuition is going to go down by about $1,400 per student. Um, they're a great program. They're very effective. Um, the students that were paying, you know, twenty-five thousand dollars a year um, to serve through that program would typically cost us anywhere from sixty to one hundred and thirty thousand if we had to send them out to another another locale. Um, so it does. I did some calculations uh, two years ago. Um, this program, by its existence, probably saves us about a million dollars every every six to seven years. Um, so they're in pretty good shape. Can I ask a question about the Raven program? This is sure. kind of confuse me a little bit. So because I know that we have separate discussions about RTCC, we talk about the director. How is Raven structured as far as like who is like the director of Raven? Are the teachers that are teaching in Raven part of the union that we discuss with? Like there's just never any discussion. Yeah. Raven. So Raven um, is it's probably try the best way to describe this. When it was originally conceived and it's been we've been shifting it a little bit. Um, it was in the building that was out behind the tech center. And so there's basically two adults that, that supervise it. There's an instructor and a, and a para. Um, there's usually about 14 kids, give or take, um, total that are in it. Um, it's a vocationally based program. They have educational periods during the day and then they spend a lot of time with, um, with engine repair um, to keep them motivated, to keep them interested. Um, in the early days, it was overseen by the director of the tech center. And it was only done that way because of the physical locale, right? If you had a discipline problem that was beyond the, the teacher's ability, you needed an administrator um, to be able to go and help. Um, or, you know, if, if the students needed to see the school nurse like anybody else does, they would go see the nurse um, through the tech center. Um, now that they are over at uh, the building by central office, um, central office has kind of taken over that role um, for the most part. Um, as that, that overall administrative body uh, that oversees it. And we actually do charge them a little bit for the administrative oversight um, that, uh, that, that we do, as well as we do all the financials and whatnot for them. So, so they're kind of a, if you're in a business model, they're a cost center within, within the, the, the bigger organization. They're considered part of the district, like a school part of the district? They're, they're a school, kind of a school within a school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they typically, they, they serve many more students from the sending schools than they do our own. On average, uh, you know, there's about 14 students there, about three. You know, if you average it out over, over time, it's about three students per year. Some years a little more, some years a little less from us directly. Yeah. And we've been thinking um, with the expansion and the prevalence of the autism in the district that's been growing, um, because we're kind of central in the state, um, we've had discussions um, with a couple of the other student superintendents about another school within a school concept like that for students with autism. Um, so that's kind of got derailed a little bit like a lot of things when COVID happened, but that, that may happen or we may be presenting that to the board at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. That's it for changes for budget. So, unless there's questions. Any questions for Blaine? Okay. Um, the financial reports you said. Um, yeah, what, uh, Robin wasn't going to be able to have them. Yeah, what happens? Um, they cl they close out a month, and because this is you know December second, and the month closed on December thirtieth, they have not had time to reconcile all the payables and receivables usually takes them about a week. 
So what will happen is next month you'll have two. I think by, by the, I think it's January 6th is the next meeting, so I think there's enough time for them to have that one ready. Um, but what I'll do is I'll have her just email the entire board when it's complete in a couple of days. She did say, I did talk with her a little bit, that things, there, there's no, no concerns that she has whatsoever. Uh, and how about the facilities report? Yes, yeah, uh, talk a little bit about um, get my ideas together here. So there's been a lot of work going on right now. Um, they, they probably had a, I didn't get a chance to read the paper. They probably had an article in the paper on, on it today about the water up at, at Brookfield. Um, and so what is going on is a lot of their time um, is being expended to try to get that resolved after many, many, many years. And when it all started, um, they had a report from a, a water engineer about nine years ago, which was before my time that we've been following through on, that gave a suggested plan for how do we remediate this water. Well, the water up there has lots of dissolved solids in it and a lot of chloride. And so while it's not dangerous, it, you cannot drink it. It's just completely unpalatable. Um, you know, I, I went up there, I think it took about three or four hours for the, um, the just the, the taste, the aftertaste to get out of my mouth um, when I tried some of it. So we've been providing them with, with bottled water, um, which is a good solution, but the problem is, is that when you have dissolved solids at that level, it will degrade the, the plumbing over time if it hasn't already done so. And so what the engineer recommended us doing is um, three steps. Uh, start with the cheapest one first and work your way up until you get one that works. So the cheapest step, which was between twenty-five dollars and $30,000, was to have uh, the well driller come out and seal off uh, the top portion of the old well so that you didn't have any water that was seeping in. Um, you, know, right? you draw, the, draw the, the well water from down here. You didn't want stuff seeping in from up here. Right? Because especially if it was picking up uh, you know, salt from the, the roads and things like that that was draining down. So we sealed off the, the well almost all the way to the bottom. So the only water that was flowing in was from the bottom couple of feet of, of the well hole. Um, it made an improvement. It cut the solids by half. But when the solids were a thousand times more than they, you know, they should be and you cut it in half, it's still unacceptable. Um, so the second step that they suggested was drill a new well. Um, which we did. You guys approved the money for that. Um, we didn't spend all the money, um, which, which, which was good. Um, but we got the well drilled. Um, we worked, they worked with the state geologist. They even went around to the houses um, that were around um, Brookfield and offered to test their water because you know the depth of their wells. And so we were trying to find who has the best water. So we're going to drill into that same location if we can with the help of the, the state geologist, which is what we tried to do. Um, that water came back. The salinity, salinity was about as bad, but it also had radium in it. Um, and radium, again, then raises the level that you've got radon concerns. And so we immediately set up for testing for radon. That came back fine. So we don't have radon concerns up there right now. But the final and the most expensive step is what we're looking at now. And depending upon how expensive, we may need to make some decisions about whether that's a site that we can maintain. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll say it now for the, for the first time. Um, we're looking at an osmotic uh, system um, to filter the water up there. Um, there's a moderate emplacement cost, but there's a high cost for on, to run the thing ongoing. Um, whereas like with a well, there's a high cost up front and then it's almost nothing to, 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 to keep the thing going after that. Um, so we've got a, an engineer who specializes in this coming out to take a look, but there's a lot of problems with it. And you probably may know more about it than I do. But the, um, the, the, the biggest piece is that they're not efficient. Um, on average, for every gallon of filtered water you get, you produce about three to four gallons of wastewater. Right, because you know you get the fresh stuff over here, but those three or four gallons have now concentrated all the stuff you took out of this gallon here. And given our concentrations of dissolved solids, I bet we're going to have to filter probably 10 to 15 gallons of water to get one gallon of of of, uh, of good water up there. And so that's why we've got the engineer coming in. And then the other piece to it is um, that wastewater that's produced. You know, those extra gallons you have to do something with it. 
Well, if it's not too bad, then you build another leach field like you would for a, a septic tank. It's got to be separate from the septic system, and you pump it out there. But our solids are so high that you got to wonder whether or not you know it's considered toxic waste, and we're going to have to have a hauler come in and, and, and pick it up and take it off. And so there may be significant costs to this. Can't you um, just leave it the way it is and just keep doing bottled water? Uh, we can probably do that, but I don't know what the, how long it's going to take to, to ruin those pipes completely up there. Um, and that's going to be an expense in, in itself to have to replace that periodically. Because all those dissolved solids, we're not talking about, you know, like some of the houses around here, people complain with hard water where they got 300 parts. Um, we're, we're, we're talking 2,000, 3,000 parts. Um, it's, it's very high. Um, and so that's the, the other, other piece. So... The other problematic pieces of it is any of these systems require people to be trained to be able to maintain them and keep them running, um, which we could do internally. But again, it's another, it's another cost. And if you have staff turnover, then it, it gets exceptionally costly to keep training people in the, in the water management piece. So there's a lot of pieces to go into this. Um, but I'm not saying anything until we get the idea of what the cost is and especially the, the biggest thing for me is what we have to do with the wastewater if, if we put a system in. You know, we, we had talked about potentially, you know, and this is one of the other discussions is that, geez, let's only do the osmotic for the areas where there's, uh, where people will be drinking from. Uh, that kind of makes sense, you know, you don't, don't need great water to flush a toilet. Um, but by the same token, again, you've got that, that piping piece. Uh, that stuff building up in the, in the pipes, it's like getting clogged arteries. Um, eventually it will fail. So, kind of where we're at. So, the one piece that I do as part of this discussion notify the board a little bit about, um, as long as there's no disagreement, is um, you had imp uh, approved uh, funding um, from the reserve funds, I think it was about 130000 um, for the well drilling. They only used part of that, um, and so what they would like to do is be able to use the remainder of what was allocated um, to pursue the uh, osmotic. Um, other, otherwise, all, all we'd have to do is, um, you know, just put in another vote for the board for the to do the osmotic separately from the reserve fund. But that's that's the intent, unless there's disagreement on that. How much did the well cost? Uh, they had to build a road out to it because of the site, so between 80 and 100. So it was significant. But that's, again, like I said, the engineer was uh, the, the benefit of having the well is it's a high upfront cost, but then you don't have a lot of cost to keep the thing going. Osmotic will be kind of a, would be probably a middling cost depending upon what we got to do with the wastewater. Um, but then it's going to be a high cost to replace those membranes and the filtration and whatnot. And again, I, it's going to be dramatically higher, I would think, just given the level of dissolved solids that's in that water. And then we also have to have the discussion is, um, you know, if we're able to do the osmotic, do we want it to draw from the old well or the new well? What's the problem with the old well? Since they're both, you know, the water has both about the same amount of dissolved solids, the problem with the old well is that it's a, a slow flowing well, right? Whereas the new well actually flows great, it's like, it's like crazy, so if you're, you know, doing a big draw off it, you know, you're not going to end up with problems. Um, so it might be better, uh, you know, if we're able to do the osmotic to complete the, the new well. So, so who knows? There's, there's a lot of questions there that we're, we're trying to research. So, but my job is to notify you that we plan on using that. The remainder of, of that reserve money that was for the well, uh, now that it's not being used for the well, for the osmotic, unless, unless, unless folks disagree. Um, so, or if there's other questions about this. Well, you're waiting to hear from the engineer regarding to get an idea. Ability yeah. Of an yeah. And that's that's probably going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, that's not a, that's not going to be an easy easy thing to figure out. Interesting piece is um, I don't think it's coming from the road salt. I mean, it could be, but the concentrations in an aquifer that size are just too huge. Um, so then the question is, is where is it coming from? So you gotta wonder what the homeowners around there. The homeowners, their water is fine. Uh, I think when we tested, I think there were there were two that were in kind of the same boat, oh. if I remember, because we did that a year ago, um, and then there was one or two that were really good, and those are the ones that they were shooting for. Hmm. But yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. 
Where is the well? The old one or the new one? Either, both. So if you're facing Brookfield, when you drive into the parking lot, the old well is literally right in the front. It sticks out of the ground. You can actually see it. Um, it's right in front of the building. Um, the new one, if you go across the athletic fields through the trees, eh, this is where they put that drive it in. Access yeah, area. it's it's, it's down there. The so the the well, the the actual borehole, the well, and everything is complete. Um, you know, we didn't put a pumping station or anything there at, the, at this point in time, um, but there is a, a serviceable yeah. water source. Yeah, they, they, somebody donated quite a bit of land out there. Um, so there is quite a bit of land that, that uh, Brookfield Bell is. Is that second well connected to the school already? No. Awesome. I think no, we've got, the got the, we've got the line ready to go, yeah. but it's, it's not connected. And part of it is we don't want to, we don't want to do it until we have to because we were trying to connect it with the, um, it needs to be repaved up there. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to rip that, that, that up yeah. because you have to put the pipes in under where the pavement is, it makes sense to kind of do it all at the same time. So, yeah, a lot of projects going on. But that's, uh, that's where their primary focus has been, been lately. Uh, and I don't know if there's any questions on the report. I apologize for being all winded tonight. So the where, where that state and where you're leaving that is they're going to look at the Oz, Oz we got We got to find out what the potential yeah. upfront cost is going to be as well as what the predicted yeah. cost is to, to maintain it. Yeah. And you'll let us know. Oh, yeah. No, it's not a decision. In the end, it's not a decision I, I, I can make by myself or should. Okay. And you're on again for the COVID operating plan? Just yeah, there, not, not much has changed. Um, a lot of it was just kind of some updates to the test to stay program. Um, it's funny, a lot of the districts ran off and started doing it right off the bat before they had all the pieces in place. Um, the thing that, that delayed us a little bit was we had to find a medical waste um, person to be able to pick the stuff up and dispose of it properly from the testing kits, the, the immediate use testing kits um, that it uses. We have that in place right now. They are actually planning on starting a, a run tomorrow with a small group of kids, and so we'll see how that goes. Again, it's a, it's, I think it's a pretty good program, but it, it becomes ineffective if you've got a lot of students at once. If you've got a, got a class, if you've got 10, 15, it's great. You got 60 or 70 just because of the, the how the test works in terms of the timing. It would be incredibly difficult to do. You could do it, but half the kids probably wouldn't get to class for half the day is over. Do we have any classes out right now? Uh, I believe we've got two. Yeah, it was um, things were quiet um, after Thanksgiving. We'll see what the holiday does by next week. We'll have a, a pretty good feel for you know, who picked up what. Um, the only other piece to kind of add to this, which is, it's not in there, um, but it's kind of related, was uh, the state um, started asking um, us to fill out a survey um, on vaccination rates. They only did it once. My guess is they're probably going to do it monthly. Um, I sent it in on November 7th. Um, <laughs> our eighth grade class had the highest vaccination rate at 75%. Um, our seniors had the lowest vaccination rate at 34%, with our juniors close behind at, at 37 And then our staff vaccination rate is 70% right now. So folks know. Um, and that's it, unless there's questions. Yeah, we've turned into a medical facility in, in addition to education. <laughs> we have. Uh, um, so next up, if there are no other other questions on the COVID, is to move on to um, our budget and setting the amount so we have it. And I'm curious, Lane, do um, you think we should up our amount to 15? Um, I mean, if if the only thing that you're planning on doing is like a strategic session in um, the piece that you're talking about, your 10 is fine. If there are other things, um, or if you know you might decide to change midstream, that hey, this isn't working for us, we want a different presenter. A lot of those presenters can be $1,600 a day. I mean, they, they can be very expensive. 
Um, so if you think that you might end up doing something else or something in addition, you know, I, I'd, I'd put in for the 15th. Right. And what people need to be thinking is this is going to be the budget that starts July 1st mm -hmm. of the coming year. So our budget for this year is already set, but um, it would be for the budget starting July 1 of 2022. Well, and you said we went over because of um, strategic plan this year, correct? Yeah, yeah I think that was 7200 or 7800 So we yeah. knew we wouldn't have that same expense again. Yeah. Right. Historically, we haven't gone over well, budget. Right. No, but, but you are doing more than previously, the previous ones. I think we'd probably be safe for staying with 10,000. Are with 10? I am. Uh, so, a motion for how much we want to allocate for the 20, 20, 22, 23 school year for the budget for the for, um, board education and training. Right? I'm getting the right school year date, right? <laughs> Fiscal year 23. Fiscal it's even confusing because we're six months off of everybody else. Yeah. The rest of the world. Make the motion that we set our training budget for the school year 2022-2023 at $10,000. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second in second. Second. And any, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 So that's passed. Uh, next up is uh, a required policy that we reviewed last time. Um, Lane, did you want to? Yeah, this is, um, you have two sets of policies. Um, you have a, a big book that's the policies that are required under state and federal mandate. Um, we, this is one of those. Um, and then you have your policy governance, um, your governance policies. Um, this one, um, by the looks of it, uh, is probably a requirement for the states to receive federal funding and to be able to distribute it to the districts. Um, this is just guaranteeing that we're going to follow the uh, Agency of Education's guidelines when it comes to how we administer our special education programs. Um, they refer to a handbook, which I don't believe has been created yet. That's how new all this is. Uh, but they're trying to get it in place for the, the federal monies that are coming. So it'll be a state handbook? Or, yeah. Agency of Education, you yeah. Have to, yeah. And, then we'll and have you to just follow. need to be familiar with it yeah. in order to... The policy that we have is kind of boilerplate, like all the districts are pretty much... Yeah, so uh, what, tip, what I typically do, um, one of two pathways, um, typically the best thing to do is the VSBA um, will create model policies. They usually work with Heather and, and PHO Lynn to do that. This is the model policy from the VSBA that I've, I've adapted you know, to us. Um, if I don't have a model policy like that to draw from, I work with the lawyers to create it. Okay, so that, unless there are further questions on it, that, that's going to move into the consent agenda as um, a policy that we're going to uh, approve in that consent agenda. Um, so are there, are there any questions on that policy before we move to the consent agenda? Okay, so, um, so that's in there. Um, we needed to review the meeting notes from the last time. Did anybody find anything that was inaccurate? Um, and then we also have the advisory um, board minutes from the RTC meeting that we had. Um, so those are in there as well. And um, I can explain those two. Yeah, the authorizing the signatures. Yeah, so um, we have three scholarship accounts um, that still have the name of the old elected treasurer on them. Um, this is to change the name to our new elected treasurer. 
Um, and so uh, it takes a board vote and it has to be shown in the, the minutes that the vote, vote occurred to be able to change the names on those accounts. And so this would be authorizing kind of two things with this consent. It's um, authorizing the name change and then authorizing Ian um, to be able to be the signature as the chair um, to, to, to sign off on it. Oh, that's sign off on. On yeah. the, the other the one, answer. there's a what's called the financial questionnaire. I don't know even why we do this. I was talking with Robin about it. It's just something we're supposed to do and keep on file. Uh, basically, what she does, and anybody can look at it who wants to, uh, is she goes down through the list, and I think it's it's checking checking in on me. You know, we have these policies in place. We don't have these in place. It's it's that, and then signing. I sign off on it to say, yep, I'm in agreement with what she said, and the, the board should sign off on it. Happens every year. I think that one. I think I did send that one. Hopefully, in the packet. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's the one. But again, it's an odd one. It's one they like like you to have the auditors and the and, and the federal, mm -hmm. but they never check it. The other thing you could do is you know you can authorize that for Ann, and if uh, Ann wants to go in and talk with Robin and whatnot too, you know that, that might not be that might be appropriate. <clears throat> well, is this something too that you put in your? your your um the monitoring report i have not included that as part of it but it would seem to me that that might be yeah i can evidence, is that you know this has yep. all been checked off and you have all of these things that you're supposed to have we're in compliance you're in compliance it would seem but it needs my my signature is a, that what a, this, a board signature a yeah. board signature we have to authorize someone to sign for it. Authorize somebody to sign for it. Okay. I think it's more that you guys have seen it as opposed to agree with it. Okay. Yeah, I would like to see this too in that monitoring. Yep. Form we'll add it for next time. As Actually, it makes sense. I wasn't even thinking about it when I was. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's one of the things that the auditors are looking for and that we should make sure is in there and that you have it. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, I think it's because it came up after I wrote the report. Uh, hold on. All right, got it. So just so, so I understand we're authorizing Ann to be signature on the financial questionnaire and on the other as an account. Yeah, to change names on the accounts to the new treasurer. So I have a question about, this, about just about this this thing. Um, so it says things like uh, it says I uh, did I see that have school board members attended financial trainings? No, is that something that they want? No, they're just board it's, members to. It's not, not, and that's what's quirky about it. It's not like it's a, uh, hmm. but it might not be a bad idea. Can we change it so it's relevant? Uh, yeah, I think it's a federal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be. It's just a federal, a, fed, right. it's a, fed, it's a federal form. They just want you to have it. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's weird. Hmm. But again, what I would do is, um, you know, if, if you authorize, if, if there's things you have questions on, don't sign it, talk with Robin before you sign it. Well, again, I think if we see this in, in that, in that yeah. um, monitoring report, I think it's just another piece that we all see, not just me. Yeah, the no, it makes sense. As a whole, I think that would be important. Um, yeah. Okay. This must. This does come from the federal because we. Do you have do, to do? Um, for loans and stuff for the towns for our projects, there questions are almost 
identical. Yeah. So Some it's, of them it's they just check boxes that you have to do. But again, I asked her about it. I said, geez, do they even check? Do they check this? She said, no, we're just supposed to have it. <laughs> well, probably the auditor checks to make sure you have it. And yeah. I'm, they're probably assuming that you're doing it might what you be, say you do on here. It might be a, an anachronism from an old law that just was never taken off the books. That happens sometimes, too. So extra paperwork. So I move to approve the consent agenda as submitted, including authorizing Anne as a signature on the account name changes and financial questionnaire. Is that appropriate? Yep. Yeah. I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Looks like it. Everyone? Okay, so we're moving on. Uh, so we're on the reports now. Um, Lynn, anything you want to add? Yeah, there were, apologies, there were three because there's a lot of stuff that happened um, that we got info from the state on um, today. Um, couple of things. Uh, first off, uh, the five years ago, um, the legislation passed a law that um, all districts were going to use the same financial software to make the transmission of data to the state system a lot easier. And when they did that, the state said, okay, because, you know, we're kind of mandating this on you, um, the state will cover the cost. So they started the, the, the process. We were actually supposed to move on to it two to three years ago, um, and the software was just horrible. Um, and so they've gotten to the point where they kept delaying and delaying in the hopes that the vendor would fix the software, get it up to speed to where it needed it to be. And unfortunately, the state signed into a contract with the vendor. And so they are at a point uh, this year where they think they're going to be going back to the legislature to say, hey, um, what we signed into a contract on is not good. Um, can you please change the law so that this is no longer a requirement? So then the question becomes is, okay, in our case, uh, we have not paid for updates on our financial software for five years because it didn't make sense since this was supposedly coming every year. Um, we have antiquated financial software. Um, and so depending upon what happens, uh, we might be on the hook for buying a new financial software package uh, after this legislative session. Um, software package probably estimate about 50 grand um, to get it in, get people up and running on it and what we need to do. And so what I will do, just to give you the heads up, is I'm going to put 50000 into that operational reserve fund from surplus at the end of this year for this specific pur purpose if it comes up, um, just to make sure that it's covered. But again, kind of unanticipated. Um, here we are. Don't know what the state's going to do. They might come back and say, um, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll still pay for it. Um, each district can do its own thing as long as it's compatible with the state system. Don't know. Um, so we talked a little bit about that today. Uh, the other thing we finally heard back, I had filled out a, some work with the state, filled out a survey like most districts um, to receive uh, HEPA filters for every classroom um, in the district. Um, they sent out the survey just before vacation for deliveries. Um, and so the hope is, is that every classroom um, across the district, including the spaces in central office that we don't have real ventilation in there, um, we'll have the HEPA filters in, in place. They said they wanted to get those deliveries um, to folks before the holidays. So we'll see if that happens. But that'll be a major logistical challenge because there's quite a few of them. Um, and then kind of more of a, a reminder, we kind of talked about this at the, the beginning, uh, but the three board members that are up for re-election this year is are Ann Kaplan, um, Ashley Lincoln, and, and Brian Baker. Just to make sure that you guys are aware. That's it. Any questions on that? Okay, so just as a recap, um, we have, I will be connecting with Jackie and the VSBA to um, make sure that we can extend that training, policy governance training, um, through to August. And then um, we'll get back to the board and let people know, and we can, um, through email, um, figure out a date to do that if, if they will extend that. Um, Chelsea and I will 
set up some time between the two of us to work on getting at least some ideas down for the annual report, and we'll work with Ben Merrill to get a draft going with that. Um, and I believe everyone should be, um, you know, preparing and looking at the monitoring reports for 2.4 and 2.5. And that's it. So Ashley, you are our meeting evaluator. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to say that I do really like um, starting the meetings, noting the objectives, and then ending with the recap um, so folks know uh, what we are expected during the course of the meeting and then the next steps. I think that's a nice um, addition, and so that was really good. Uh, the beginning part, I was going to say that we were definitely not following the agenda times, but there was great recovery and we are um, <laughs> almost right on time, so that's good news as well. Um, and from where I am sitting, it does seem like there was a fairly decent um, participation from the board. That's awesome. what I have. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we're now going to move into an executive session. I move to enter executive session we need to move at 7.40. And we don't come out of the main meeting until after. Yep. So, uh, so I'm going to switch the meeting over because I don't want folks And to our ORCA in. person. Did you vote? Oh, oh. Yeah. Sorry, we haven't voted yet, so um, second. we have a second. Brian second. is going to second. Any discussion? All right. Should, so should we say what we're going in for? Oh yeah, sorry. And we're uh, for um, potential. Do I read this thing off? Yeah, that'll work. Potential labor relations agreement with employee bus drivers with personnel issue and a real estate discussion. Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 